I knew my trip to Peru was going to be filled with chaos and nonstop problems. I'm glad I didn't know how bad it was going to be. Episodes 62, 64, and 66 were about the first three days of my trip to the high mountains of the Cordillera Blanca in the Andes Mountains of northern Peru. The area I was hiking had many peaks over 20,000 feet, or 6,100 meters, and as high as 22,205 feet, or 6,766 meters. This is Mount Huascaran. It is the highest tropical mountain in the world, and the fourth highest in the Western Hemisphere. My trip up to that time had been faced with quite a bit of violence and other challenges. The previous three days alone, I had witnessed a massacre, saw violent demonstrations, had altitude sickness, and began hallucinating. But I had reached my childhood dream of seeing the Andes Mountains. This day was a strange day of hiking. A short while into the hike, we were able to ski on the scree. The scree is very loose rock. You do this by jumping up in the air and landing sideways on the side of your feet. It is so steep and the rock so loose each time you do this, you go some distance down the mountain. You have to control your fall, just like when you stop in skiing. As you start to slow down, you jump again and land on the other side of your feet. After about 30 minutes of this, it wasn't so steep. Pedro and I then started running with our backpacks on. I am sure in my life, I have never had energy like that. We had come down quite a bit in altitude. I felt like I could sprint a marathon. It certainly had something to do with the dramatic increase in oxygen at the lower elevation. It was as if we were floating and had absolute focus. Once we no longer had the energy to keep running, the day proved strange in another way. Since we left the city of Juarez, the only people we saw were poor indigenous dressed in traditional clothing. But on this day, we were walking along and from a distance, I spotted two guys in non-indigenous clothes. I knew this was serious. I knew the guys must be revolutionaries, either Shining Path or Tupac Amur, and patrolling. I knew it was senseless to run, as they would radio others to catch me. They would also certainly start shooting. My guide was worried, very worried. As the men approached, I could see they had AK-47 automatic rifles. I wondered if this was it for me. Had I taken too many chances and my luck was finally out? That thought came across my mind, but for some reason I didn't hold on to it. I was convinced this would somehow work out. The men approached. They weren't violent. They weren't, there was no yelling. Uh, they weren't rude. But they told us to lay down on the ground on our stomachs. One of them came up to me and put his AK-47 into my temple, but in a procedural sort of way. He didn't do this with force. I could feel the cold of the steel at the end of the rifle barrel. Pedro was mostly quiet, and the two armed men talked little. They took everything out of my backpack. My thinking was I was going to lose it all. Peru is a very poor country, and my camera alone was worth much more than most Peruvians made in two years. I also had money with me, quite a bit, and other things of value. But nothing was taken, nothing. I was shocked. Why, I wondered, was nothing taken. They had military-grade cellular phones, the kind I've seen from footage of the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. They were trying to reach their commander. When they did, they asked if they should kill us. The man on the phone walked around as he spoke, and I couldn't hear most of the conversation. He was calm in his energy. The two revolutionary groups of the Shining Path and Tupac Amur were at war with the Peruvian government and had murdered 
large numbers of people. The Quechua Native Americans would be murdered by the revolutionaries for siding with the Peruvian government and murdered by the Peruvian military for siding with the revolutionaries. The revolutionaries wanted to overthrow Peru's government and instill a Maoist government like in China. It was my guess that through orders the revolutionaries holding us hostage had killed many people. The decision to kill or not kill us seemed no more important to them than what shirt they might wear that day. I realized the one talking on the phone wasn't talking to his commander, or at least not in the beginning. A thought occurred to me that my life was out of my hands, although I suppose I should be so naive to believe my life was ever really in my hands anyway. I think in normal life, I am slow to speak, quiet. I've been told this many times, but in the most intense of situations, I come alive. My brain thinks far quicker, and it is like I receive 30 or 40 IQ points. In these situations, I know the perfect thing to say, to do, how to react. I am always surprised afterwards. It just happens. There is always clarity and calm in my head. It is usually why I have the confidence that I will get out of any situation. I then spoke up. I spoke politely but forcefully. I can't recall all that I said, and I spoke more than once. My voice spoke as, as if it were speaking for them. It was as if I were in the commander's head. I told them the choice to kill me is clearly theirs. I know my life was nothing to them, dead or alive. I was not asking them to spare my life from a humanitarian perspective, as I knew they were too engrossed in the war to care about such things. I told them that my government didn't care if I lived or died, but there is one negative for them. I told them that my government is always looking for a way to discourage the cocaine trade, and on top of it, the cocaine was funding both revolutionary organizations. My death might be an excuse for my government to send down military personnel, which it actually wound up doing later on. I asked them, is that what they really wanted, was to fight two armies, Peru and the United States. They relayed the messages. I believe at that point, the commander was on the other side of the cellular phone. It took some time before the decision was made. Of course, unless you're now listening to a ghost, you know the outcome. The two told us to go on our way. I later found out the reason we were stopped. We were very close to the Walega Valley, maybe a few miles. As I understand it, the Walega Valley produces the coca plant, which produces the most milk. These leaves, then, are the most valued for the process of making cocaine. I think their biggest concern was that we were transporting coca leaves or cocaine. Once they let us go, I felt a tremendous peace. Life suddenly seemed easier. It felt like I was floating the rest of the day. I had survived, in a sense, the worst thing that could happen to a traveler. I had survived being taken hostage by a deadly terrorist organization. I thought maybe one day I could publish the story. I think I smiled the rest of that day. It was another day of chaos in Peru. But it was strange. Pedro and I didn't talk about what happened. We just went forward with the hike as if it hadn't happened. I've read recently that just before I arrived to this area, Tupac Amur made their headquarters in the Walega Valley, but the Cheyenne Path was also using the Walega Valley. Had I known these facts, I wouldn't have visited this area. These are rival organizations, but I'm not sure if there was fighting between them. I don't think so, as the Shining Path was a much larger organization. Thank you so much for watching. Please support the channel by subscribing and liking, 
as this is how YouTube decides to send it on to others. Have a great day and see you in the next episode.